So following on from our second part with regards to in-situ chemical oxidation using a technology called Regenox, as mentioned, quite often what we would recommend is a combined ISCO, so in-situ chemical oxidation, combined with enhanced natural attenuation, or ENA. Um, to do this, we would typically use Regenox, this in-situ chemical oxidant, as a technology to reduce that contaminant mass to levels that are more amenable to enhanced, in this case, aerobic biological degradation. And typically that threshold is in and around 10 milligrams per litre TPH. Now, as I may have mentioned before, when I say TPH, I mean a mixed diesel gasoline plume. So that 10 milligrams per litre isn't applicable for all hydrocarbons across the, across the spectrum. This is really something that we're focusing on with regards to mixed diesel gasoline plumes. This would be completely different if we were looking at, say, a highly weathered, uh, site, perhaps something like a gas works, um, where 10 milligrams per litre may not actually be appropriate for enhanced biological degradation. And that's why that upfront consultation phase that we in Regenesis offer is really important. So to expedite this rate of natural attenuation for petroleum hydrocarbons in situ, we would recommend using a technology called ORC Advanced or Oxygen Release Compound Advanced. And what we're looking to do is accelerate that rate of natural attenuation. So if we just pause for a second, natural attenuation is just a description of uh, microbes in the subsurface that are breaking down this contamination uh, in situ. This is something that would be going on naturally um, using ambient uh, electron um, donors or acceptors, depending on the type of contaminant that we're looking to degrade. So that rate of natural attenuation is governed by a number of different factors. So this could include the contaminant itself. So as I alluded to before, its structure and solubility has a huge impact on how easily this particular compound is going to attenuate. So, for example, it's much easier for uh, microbes to break down a dissolved phase gasoline plume than it is a diesel plume, down to the structure and solubility um, of those two TPH compounds. Um, similarly, it's much easier to uh, break down BTEX than it is PAHs. And again, that's down to the solubility of those particular compounds. So the contaminant nature has a, has a big impact, as does how that contamination is distributed. Is it in the is it in uh, the free phase? And we'll talk about that in a, in a bit more in the final part of this, this discussion, um, where you have free phase contamination at such high levels, uh, the hydrocarbons can actually become toxic to the microbes that want to break them down. Um, so that can inhibit the rate of natural attenuation. Is it in the dissolved phase? Ideally, that's what we are wanting it to be in, is in the dissolved phase so we can uh, break down that, the, those contaminants um, readily. Or is it in the sorb phase? So is it, is it, in a, uh, is it stuck onto the soil? Um, is it readily available for these microbes to break down? Is it still bioavailable? Finally, then the environment has an influence. So the temperature of the groundwater. So here in the UK, um, we find that temperature isn't that much of a limiting factor. Uh, the groundwater temperature tends to be pretty stable throughout the year. Um, I have seen jobs in uh, Sweden and particularly in Finland where the groundwater temperature does drop, drops below, say, six degrees Celsius, and you do see microbial activity slowing down. So microbiology, so with regards to petroleum hydrocarbon treatment, I wouldn't say that microbiology is often a limiting factor. It's pretty unusual. In fact, I've never seen it um, in the eight years that I've worked in Regenesis, where we have had to do some bio-augmentation to kickstart the natural attenuation of petroleum hydrocarbons in situ. So often biology isn't the limiting factor. Uh, as I said, temperature sometimes can be, but um, you know, not for, for countries um, such as the UK where we don't have uh, big changes in temperature through the year. 
So then finally, uh, co-nutrients, uh, again, can be beneficial. There is some benefit to adding co-nutrients to kickstart that, but often the single limiting factor is respiration. Um, so in this case, the availability of electron receptors, as we're talking about petroleum hydrocarbons. Um, in other cases for other contaminants, such as chlorinated solvents, it's actually the availability of electron donors. But here, for petroleum hydrocarbons, it's the availability of electron acceptors. Generally, this rate of natural attenuation is governed by a single factor, and that factor is the availability of an electron acceptor or oxygen. So using this uh, technology called ORC, this oxygen releasing compound, we're looking to support that weakest link to increase the rate of breakdown. So in terms of what these microbes are doing, these microbes are cascading electrons from donor compounds to receptor compounds. And it's that cascade, it's that exchange of electrons that releases energy, and it's that release of it, and it's that energy that the microbe then needs to live. So you have the electron donor. So in this case, it is the uh, petroleum hydrocarbon. So it's the contaminant that is the electron donor. And then you have the electron acceptors. Um, so there's a wide range of electron acceptors that these microbes can use. We will talk about um, some of them in the fourth part of this, of this discussion of in situ remediation of hydrocarbons in situ. But this time we're just going to focus on oxygen. So of that list of possible electron acceptors, oxygen as an electron acceptor provides the most energy um, as, and therefore it is preferentially used up by these microbes in situ. Quickly then followed on by nitrate, iron and sulfate, finally down to carbon dioxide and then uh, you end up with uh, methanogenic conditions. Now to give you some context as to how much more energy oxygen um, brings to this reaction. Uh, if you take something like benzene, for example, benzene would, in an anaerobic environment, have a half-life of about 24 months. However, in an aerobic environment, benzene has a half-life of about 10 days. So you do see a real step change in how quickly and how efficiently these microbes can break down um, petroleum hydrocarbons and, and BTEC substances under aerobic conditions. So what ORC is, so oxygen release compound is a technology. Um, it's been around uh, since the mid 90s. It's been used on tens of thousands of sites worldwide. Um, is a technology that comprises calcium oxyhydroxide where we've interpolated a phosphate crystal into that structure. And after a single injection, it will continue to release oxygen under a control, uh, it will continue to release oxygen for a 12 month period. And crucially, that release of oxygen is controlled. So you're creating a stable environment over a long period of time. So a large microbial consortia can grow. So you break down as much of that contamination as possible. So in terms of what this plays out like in a remediation scheme, you have your impacted groundwater, and then you apply ORC advanced to the subsurface. Now, as I say, ORC advanced comprises calcium oxyhydroxide, and within this, there are phosphate crystals that have been interpolated into that structure. So once injected into the subsurface, ORC will start to dissolve, and as it dissolves, it will release oxygen. Now, because you're having this controlled release of oxygen, you are not seeing lots of off-gassing, lots of bubbling to the surface. All the oxygen remains in the dissolved phase where it can be utilized by the microbes that are already in the subsurface. Now, as ORC dissolves, a calcium hydroxide crust would form, and it's the job of those phosphate crystals to disrupt the crust. So you, you get this continual release of oxygen up to 17% weight for weight, over a 12 month period. And it's that controlled release that creates this stable environment over a long period of time. So you build up a large consortia of microbes so you can break down that contaminant mass in situ from a single application. 
So you're not looking to go back, do lots of top up injections. This is designed to be a single application to degrade that contaminant mass in situ. Typically, we would look at a site and we would look at the concentrations you have and then perhaps your aspirational remedial targets. Uh, and then we will calculate stoichiometrically how much oxygen you need to break down that amount of contaminant mass. And we'll also take into account uh, ambient oxygen sinks, et cetera. And using that information, we will provide you with a bespoke dose for that particular site. So if you have watched the um, second uh, part of this discussion, we talked about Regenox, the in situ chemical oxidant, and we've been talking about ORC, this oxygen releasing compound that has been engineered to accelerate the rate of natural attenuation. And more often than not, these two technologies are used together as part of a treatment train. And what I'm going to do is just talk you through a fairly typical case study, fairly typical site where these technologies are used. Um, and it was a former petrol filling station in the east of England. Now, this site um, had been uh, a petrol filling station. Um, it had subsequently been uh, mothballed and then a developer had purchased it with the intention to redevelop it into a series of residential dwellings. A site investigation was carried out by an environmental consultant and unidentified two uh, source areas of contamination which required remediation. So this was in a uh, former tank, underground tank area, UST area here, as well as then an uh, interceptor. So here we partnered with a remediation contractor that initially did a uh, tank pool, so removed and de decommissioned the tanks, dug out the worst of the contamination, dewatered that excavation to recover any free phase contamination, and then applied ORC advanced to the base of that excavation. Now, in this case, they used OR, a form of ORC that is pelletized. Typically, when you inject ORC into the ground, we, it comes as a powder and you mix it with water at about 30% dilution. Um, but we do have it in a pellet form as well, just to minimize the amount of dust that is created. Afterwards, they installed a series of injection wells down gradient of these two source areas. Um, here, where concentrations were uh, very high, um, above that 10 milligram per litre mark, there was a need to do two rounds of chemical oxidation using Regenox to reduce that contaminant mass so then it was more amenable for uh, enhanced natural attenuation. So ORC was then applied after two injections of Regenox. And the key thing here is that the injection wells were installed perpendicular to groundwater flow. So on this site, groundwater is flowing from left to right. Uh, they completed the chemical oxidation exercises to reduce that contaminant mass. They then injected ORC in a barrier configuration so that as this contamination advects and diffuses across the site, it hits this aerobic zone and uh, the microbes that are in the subsurface break down that residual contamination so the water that comes out the other side of this injection line is comparatively cleaner than that that went than, uh, that vected into it. Um, so they had installed effectively uh, two in situ permeable reactive barriers. In terms of the results, so you can see here that the product thickness um, measurable product was removed from the site uh, and um, remained uh, below detection um, throughout the monitoring period. And then finally, the dissolved phase targets that we had. So you can see these are the three phases of remediation. Here we had targets for aromatic C8 to 10 and C10 to 12. And after the ORC and Regenox injections, you can see sustained reduction in the C8 to 10 range. Um, we were starting off there initially with 17 milligrams per liter. You see the sustained reduction over a th three month period where we eventually achieve the remedial goals for um, the C8 to 10 and C10 to 12 fractions. So that's just an example of how this technology can be used. Also, once the ORC is in the ground, um, and this was done on this particular site, you can get on and start with other phases of enabling works. So if you have a piling mat 
that you need to um, construct, then you can get on and do that. Meanwhile, the ORC is in, in situ creating this aerobic environment. So you're, you're continuing to get remediation whilst you're getting on with other enabling work phases. So the problem though, often with enhanced bio as a standalone technology is that it's very hard to predict when we're gonna hit that remediation goal. Um, we'll get into this in the second part, but what we are doing more and more now is combining enhanced um, natural attenuation with our colloidal technologies. Um, the one I'm gonna introduce to you is called Petrofix. Uh, that is a colloidal activated carbon that is designed to absorb contamination and accelerate the biological degradation. But that's in the next talk. Thank you very much.